the next talk is what separates the shiny app debugging masters from the mere mortals. We all know the sinking feeling when your app breaks down and you have no idea why. But fear not and get ready to level up your shiny app debugging skills and become the hero of your team. The next presenter, Tan Ho, who's a machine learning engineer for Zealous Analytics. He's an active member of R4DS community, streams live coding of R and Shiny in his Twitch channel. He loves to ski, he loves weightlifting, he loves rowing, and occasionally craving pumpkins, and hanging out with his dog, Jasper. Tan maintains a whole suite of tools and packages for fantasy football lovers out there. Now you might wonder, how does one get time to do all of this? And I'm guessing if you debug your shiny apps effectively, you will have enough time for these things. So without further ado, let me introduce Tan to the stage. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Yeah, my name's Tan. Uh, I'm an ML engineer with Zealous Analytics. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I maintain the Dynasty Process Trade Calculator, which is a shiny app that serves over 200,000 unique monthly users um, and work on a bunch of other side projects, including NFLverse and mentoring at R4DS online learning community. And most importantly, I love debugging. Um, and I'm super excited to be talking about debugging shiny apps today. So you can find materials for this talk at tanho.ca slash debugging dash shiny. Let's get started. There we go. Pop quiz. What does this error mean? So let's say you've got the code on the left and the error message that's on the right. Error, it says. Unexpected bracket. Sure enough, you go back to your code, you skim through it, you find the pesky extra bracket that's there, right? That's pretty easy. Let's try a more difficult one. What does this error mean, part two? This one's a bit more complex. The app on the left lets you choose a car, then filter the empty cars data set, and then provide some information about the car in a table. The error message says, error, no applicable method for select, apply to object of class, reactive expression, reactive, or function. So in Shiny, reactives are a function that we call to return the value of that expression at that instant within the state of the app. We want to pass the value of the function to the select. So we trace back the error with the helpful set of error messages, thank you, dplyr developers, and see that on line 21, we're passing the myCar reactive function to the select. We actually want to be passing a data frame, right? So we need to add brackets to call the function and then pass that data frame that comes out of the function to the select, right? So we solved problem two. Let's go to part three. What does this error mean? This time, instead of rendering a table, we're calculating the average miles per gallon. The error on the right says error in dollar sign. Object of type closure is not subsetable. Congratulations, it's the most infamous error in R. Time to scratch it off your bucket list. This one normally stumps a lot of us, at least when we were starting out with Shiny. Notice that it doesn't print out a helpful trace back this time. That's because it's a base R function, and so it doesn't have the same level of error messaging. So what the heck is a closure, right? If we, need, if we want to solve this, we need to figure out what a closure is. Well, if we find it in advanced R, we'll learn that a closure is the C type name for an R function. And so if we know that a closure refers to a function and we know that reactives are functions, we can do a bit of digging and realize it's the exact same problem as before. We've forgotten the parentheses on our reactive again. There it is on line 21. So how many of you have seen these error messages before? How many of you knew exactly where to look to find the problem? I'll bet a lot of you knew straight away. So my question is, how did we learn to recognize these on site? The answer is that we solve all of, almost all of these problems by building and using mental models. So here's a model about how different experience levels might think about problems. So let's say you're an experienced Shiny developer and you're presented with problem F. An object of type closure is not subsetable. This has bitten you a thousand times before, so you know to start looking for parentheses that you forgot again. In other words, you skip all the steps to figure that out and you go to A where you find it and you continue on with your day. However, 
A novice who's new to Shiny will look at that problem and think it's a complete foreign language. They'll know that F connects to E somewhere in my code, but from there, they don't have the experience or knowledge to connect their way all the way back to A. In order to learn how to solve their problem and move towards understanding, they need to work through every concept and how it links to the previous one. So you got to figure out that closures are functions, reactives are functions, reactive needs to be called with parentheses, etc. As you learn to link these concepts together, you become more competent and move, to way, move your way towards expertise in this area. And eventually, you too will start remembering and skipping from closure not subsettable to you forgot your parentheses. So how do we build better mental models for Shiny? The answer, debugging, right? When you come to a problem, you figure out why the problem exists, and then you learn. So the first tool for debugging any Shiny app is leveraging your existing mental models. Chances are you wrote this app. You know what it depends on, what data it uses, what logic it's meant to be applying. So it's always good to start by observing. Unfortunately, we've all made this app before. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of code chunks. However, you're the expert. You've got a good mental model about how this app is supposed to work. And you've got a rough idea of where the problem is. So how do we dig into it? Well, we can physically, literally dig into it, just like this guy is digging through his CVS receipt by using browser. Browser is your best friend. Here's an example of an app, and you notice a problem. There's no data in this table, but you're darn sure there should be something in here. Well, if you have a rough idea of where the problem's happening, you can stick a browser into it and get interactive insight into what's happening inside of that reactive. In this case, let's throw a browser statement in the middle of this render DT so we can see what's going on inside. So you can see once you run this that what the current state of the reactives are and write and interact with the code. So we can check things, right? Are, are the inputs correct? Well, if you print out the input car, you'll see that it's a Mazda RX-4. That seems normal, it seems to be valid. How about the DF empty cars code that happened just before the browser? Well, it seems a little weird that there's zero rows at this very minute. That means there's something wrong. Well, if we look at the code, we'll notice that we're filtering for sill in input car. We actually want car in input car, not sill in input car. So if you go ahead and make the change, and run the code, and you can literally just rerun the code right there in the browser, you'll see that we've now found that missing row that we were looking for. And then you remove the browser and you continue on with your app. You can also extend browser to browse everything that's in your app by pairing it with an action button inside of an observe event. This gives you insight to any portion of the code. So let's say your app wasn't structured the exact same way, and so you don't know where to put it, with the power of this debug button, you click the debug button, you get access inside of your browser again, and then you can call any reactive. So here we check to see why is my car missing? Well, there's zero rows, so you start looking at that reactive, and you know, same problem, right? Now you solve the problem and move on. Okay, so if you cite, if you've tried solving the problem in context, you use browser, you work on that tool, and you're stuck or you need to hit a million buttons to get to that particular portion of the logic and reproduce the problem, um, and you're frustrated. What next? The answer, reproducible examples. In the R universe, we love reprexes. It's a wonderful tool for simplifying all of the extraneous noise that surrounds your problem. There's already a lot of resources out there on reprexes, so I'll touch on a few ideas and resources specific to Shiny. Really, in my experience, there's two approaches to reprexes in Shiny. The first way is to peel away complexity from the current app. So you start with the app in question, you start taking things out of it until eventually you get towards a simplified version of the same app and you know you find the problem. Uh, there's a great video out there by Hadley. It's linked here and I'll, it'll be linked in the resources at the end of this presentation. Um, but he basically takes kind of a medium-sized example that someone's tried to share and starts peeling things away. So takes away this dependency, takes away this package, uses a different data set. And eventually it becomes incredibly obvious what the problem is because there's basically no code left except the problem. Um, in true inspiration uh, by the masters, I also tried my hand at doing something similar with an R4DS Slack problem and did it on Twitch. The recording is here. 
Um, it is quite an involved process, and I think it's a little bit outside of the time, but I think I'd highly recommend you guys go check that out um, after this after this talk. Um, and then kind of the other approach is the other way. So you start from scratch, start with the Shiny App snippet that comes out of our studio, and progressively add code. This is an approach I use more frequently, especially with more complicated Shiny Apps that I've written. Um, and basically what you do is you start with the base app and you start adding back the bare minimum of pieces that will reproduce the problem. This is really good if you have that really complicated, that really long app, lots of context, and you've already done your work in you know, observing what's going on. So if you can start picking out those problems, you can start adding it to this other shiny app and then from there work on sharing it, right? So the overall goal is to reproduce the bug with the absolute minimum. So in terms of in terms of dependency packages, in terms of lines of code, in terms of context and domain knowledge required. In doing so, we're hoping that the we're hoping that, you know, if you're really lucky, the solution will suddenly strike you as you as you see it. And failing that, you can isolate what this problem code is and start asking for help. It's much easier to explain your problem to a much broader support group if it's self-contained and it doesn't contain competitive secrets personal health information, or otherwise sensitive and complicated data. OK, so with Browser and Reprexes now in your toolkit, I think you can tackle almost any bug that you'll come across in Shiny. And if not, you'll be in a good position to get help. So the last thing I want to talk about today is something that's massively changed how I develop Shiny apps for the better. Ready? Shiny is not where the magic happens. I'll repeat that. Shiny is not where the magic happens. Functions are where the magic happens within your app. To kind of showcase what I mean, here's a flashback to the first ever Shiny app that I wrote. It's called the Dynasty Process Crystal Ball. I've zoomed out to fit as much of the server function on the screen as possible, and I've only really managed to get like the first 200 lines or so in here. So obviously you can't read what's going on, but it contains the usual set of data frames stored as a reactive that's nested together deeply, deeply in tidyverse code. In order to run any given portion of it, I need to run the entire app and figure out how to trigger the reactive I want to test. So that's sort of so you know there's a lot of stuff going on, but I'm going to explain it as I would explain to a human. What does this app actually do? Well, one, it's a fantasy football app that logs onto the users league via an API, downloads the current standings and the remaining schedule, determines the relative strengths of each team based on standings creates probability of winning the winning ga remaining games on the schedule, and then returns to the user a table with the expected wins for the rest of the season and where the model thinks they'll finish at the end of the year. This sort of pattern sounds pretty common. Sure, there's a lot of details about fantasy football here, um, but the idea is very transferable to a ton of the apps that I've ever written, and I'm sure that you've written as well. But how much of this logic actually needs Shiny and needs to be done in Shiny? Well. The two parts that I think need to be done in Shiny, one, the user supplies their username, password, and league ID, right? The user has to give you something, and then the user receives the output as a, as a data table, as a download, however, however that happens. The rest of it, well, this doesn't need to be done in Shiny, right? Logging into the API, downloading standings, downloading the schedule, doing the fancy math, all of that stuff doesn't need to be done within the code of the Shiny app. The Shiny needs to call that or figure out how to receive this information, but this is not Shiny's domain. Shiny doesn't do anything like that. So why are we including you know, reactives and all this stuff that goes into it? If I had to rewrite this app today, I would make it look more like this. So you take, um, I'd move every single component that doesn't directly deal with collecting the data from the user or presenting the data to the user into functions, subfunctions, whatever it takes. So the server function would now be one observe event paired with four functions. An API login that accepts the username, password, and league ID. It downloads the standings. It downloads the schedule. And then it calculates the projected wins and saves that to reactive values and then returns those projections as a data table. Why, why would you do this? Well, there's a lot of benefits. Um, one, you don't need to hop through the entire shiny click and input routine to get to a certain bit of logic. You can just assign some argument variables and get on with solving the problem. Two, you can abstract the complexity into well-named functions so you don't need to think about the internals of things. So when I say download standings, it's very clear and obvious what that 
what that function is going to do. And I don't need to keep what's going on in that function in my head as I work through things, right? I've abstracted it. So the function downloads standings. What else do you need to know? It returns a data frame, right? That's all you need to know. You can also check the contents of each argument and then print out helpful errors for future you. Remember that dplyr select function that we used and it printed out all this stuff? That made it much easier to figure out what went wrong and why, right? And you can do the same thing with functions when it behaves unexpectedly. So you can pay yourself back to future you, pay future you a favor by, you know, doing, you know, argument checks, helpful errors, and of course, writing unit tests to ensure that the logic works consistently. Even as your code changes, as the app grows, as long as you write unit tests to ensure that the logic is working, you're going to have a much easier to maintain app. So in short, my suggestion is keep Shiny simple. Pass the inputs to your functions and present the outputs. OK, so here are some takeaways. Today, I've talked about my three favorite tools for debugging, investigating the problem in context with browser, creating a reprex to drill down the relevant parts of the problem, and abstracting business logic into functions. And I'm going to end today by sharing a comic by Julia Evans. It's entitled, How I Got Better at Debugging. So one, remember, the bug is happening for a logical reason. It's never magic, really, even when it makes no sense. Two, be confident that you can fix it. You've fixed a lot of hard bugs before. Three, know your debugging toolkit. In this case, the very tools I just talked about. Talk to your coworkers, and if they're not very helpful, try the R community. We love helping. And most importantly, you learn to like debugging because you know you're about to learn something new. So let's put on our determined faces and get out there. Thank you. What a great presentation and error pop quiz. Uh, I'm sure everyone now just can't wait to get an error in their Shiny apps uh, and use the techniques that uh, you presented. Uh, I see so much love for a browser in the chat. Uh, thank you for uh, giving browser a much voice that it uh, needs. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, I, I was actually about to ask you, uh, based on the Libby's comment, that you're too calm. Uh, I and I have to say that uh, your talk helps me to uh, approach debugging in a rational way. And uh, your last uh, slide basically convinced me that, okay, yeah, uh, th there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, coming into errors. Uh, but do you have any recommendations for people to approach debugging in a calm state of mind? Yeah, so I absolutely adore everything that Julia Evans writes and does. And she shares, an, she just wrote a new um, debugging manifesto and it's not related to R, but I think the approaches are very similar, right? And so there's a lot of resources um, and comics and designs that she does to kind of explain the thought processes behind debugging. Um, and I think that's the other part that I really like about debugging is that like building that mental model, right? And so when I kind of go through the mental model and talk about it, it's very clear sometimes. And so sometimes the help that people give you is like, yeah, so it's a closure. That means you need to put brackets here. And you don't, they don't explain how you connect those dots together. But it is always possible to me to go, for, to go from this problem to this solution. Sure, you might need you know, this background or this, back, this other knowledge or whatever. And someone will have to explain some of that to you. But the idea is always that if you don't understand what's going on, it's because your mental model has a gap and so you need to figure out how to fill that right and so that's where debugging comes in really handy okay uh, and i'm curious to know what was the most recent bug that you fixed the most recent bug that i fixed yeah so in data table um this one came up pretty recently um if you have a column that's a character and you try to assign and, and then you're trying to mutate inside of it, um, it can be a little deceptive because what happens is, let's say you've got a character column that's named last modified, and it actually contains a date. If you mutate a new date, it'll get immediately cast to character. Um, and this is, I'm not sure if it's a feature or a bug, but 
when you expect something to be a date and it is not a date, lots of things go wrong, but you can't reproduce the problem because it, um, the, the column, it's, you don't think about the fact that that column already exists in there. So if, this, if there's like the data frame is like 500 columns wide and one of the columns has the same name as the one you're trying to make, it will immediately try to cast what you made to the original type. Um, and so this makes it really challenging because when you're, you know, using the strategies like I was talking about and reproducing the problem, if you start from scratch and you try to assign a new column, you don't think about the fact that there's a column name already there. Um, so that one threw me for quite a while, but eventually I figured it out and, uh, you know, started investigating the app that was there and reproducing it. And uh, yeah, very much the same approaches. Awesome. Uh... Celeste wants to know uh, about some re uh, restructuring of functions. So uh, when, do, when you normally store uh, functions, uh, do you have a separate R script uh, that you source at the beginning of app, or how does that work? Yeah, so I'm very partial to, um, I will probably not make friends when I say that I'm not very partial to Gollum. Gollum. Um, and I prefer to have kind of one app.r file that kind of contains everything. And then Shiny has this feature that basically automatically sources anything that's in an R subfolder of the same app. And I use that a lot. So basically, I design my apps kind of like a package with an app.r at the top level, and then all of the sub functions that are stored in R files. Um, and then you put that you, you basically use those functions inside of app.r. And if you've got modules, that's part of the functions. Um, and then you can use the modules in app.r as well. Awesome. Uh, and a little bit general, uh, uh, the R4DS community is very welcoming, as you mentioned. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that. In fact, uh, uh, starting out, I think two years, I have never uh, uh, had any connection with the R community, which made my life really harder. So can you talk a little bit about the community and how people can help others? Yeah, so you can join R4DS Slack community. Um, I think John has the short link. It's called R4DS, so R number four, DS dot IO slash join. Um, and you basically join our Slack community um, where we've kind of got it set up. Kind of, there's two kind of, streams of information. So one is like just this whole set of help channels. Um, and basically anyone can ask a question and anyone can answer the question. Um, there's a group of mentors that help try to solve, make sure every question gets answered. Um, I'm often on there. I'm actually very famously easy to nerd snipe. So I will often, sometimes I will just like get distracted by seeing a question and then start trying to figure out the answer. Um, and so this is actually like, you know, getting a ton of reps at debugging along the way, right? Because you're, you're debugging not just your own bugs, but everyone else's bugs. And so that one's really helped me a lot. Um, and another thing that we started recently, uh, I say recently, I, I mean during the pandemic, uh, which is now not recent, um, but we've got a whole bunch of book clubs that work through various R books. So we've just finished working through um, Advanced R, R for DS, um, mastering Shiny, JavaScript for R. And so if you're interested in any particular topic, we've got, we've probably got the public book in a book club and the group would totally be, you know, happy to kind of work through the book with you on a weekly basis and talk about what you learned. Um, so highly recommend that Slack community. It has a ton of things. Awesome. Uh, Chris wants to know, uh, he's new to modules. Uh, how can uh, someone uh, like this decide where the logic goes into the function and what logic goes into the module? Modules are apps, right? So anything that can be separated into a separate function um, and run individually. Um, so basically when I think of functions, I think of something that returns the same output given the same input. And if you can do that, um, you, you, I would separate that entirely into its own function. Uh, and then modules are basically just abstractions of Shiny. So they would belong to the Shiny side of things. And that's code for 
and that's the code that would call the function and then pass it the inputs. So I would separate logic um, into functions and then modules as calling functions and then app dot r as calling the modules this is how i would personally separate that awesome uh, thank you for answering all the questions uh, we don't have any more and thanks for an amazing talk very welcome thanks for having me